Hi guys and welcome back to day five of our Harry Potter read aloud. Stick around after this video and I'm going to ask you a couple trivia questions. The first people to dojo me the answers will get a prize sent home. All right, let's start. When we finished, um, yeah, what we finished yesterday, we're, we had stopped. They were just about to start with their um, flying lessons, okay? All right. The Slytherins were already there, and so were 20 broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madam Hooch, arrived. She had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are y'all waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. And this is where we stopped yesterday. Ready? Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old, and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madam Hooch at the front, and say up. Up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground, and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were afraid, thought Harry. There was a quaver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end and walked up and down the rows, correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground, hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet, and then come straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, three, two... But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back, boy, she shouted, but Neville was rising straight up like a cork, shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet. Harry saw a scared white face look down at the ground, falling away, saw him gasp, slip sideways off the broom, and wham! A thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher and started to drift lazily toward the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madam Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy, it's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of, you cla of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face, the great lump? The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Parvati Patil. Ooh, sticking up for Longbottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like fat little crybabies, Parvati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The remember all glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said ha Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to find. How about up a tree? Give it here, Harry yelled, but Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well. Hovering level with the topmost branches of an oak, he called. Come and get it, Potter! Harry grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madam Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground, and up, up, he soared. Air rushed through his hair, and his robes whipped out behind him, and in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground and an admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh, yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leaned forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands and it shot toward Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about face and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crab and goyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. 
The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted, and he threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ear, mingled with the stream screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand. A foot from the ground, he caught it, just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass with the remembral clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! His heart sank faster than he just dived. Professor McGonagall was running towards them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never in all my time at Hogwarts! Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses flashed furiously. How dare you! Might have broken your neck! It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patia. But Malfoy, that's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him. He had to jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd be packing his bags in ten minutes. What would the Dursley say when he turned up on the doorstep? Up the front steps, up the marble staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open doors and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taking him to Dumbledore. He thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others becoming wizards while he stumped around the grounds carrying Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick? Could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood, thought Harry, bewildered. Was wood a cane she was going to use on him? But wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched, up on, on, they marched on up the corridor, wood looking curiously at Harry. In here! Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom that was empty except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out, cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a seeker. Wood's express expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boy's a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be being expelled, and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught that thing in his hand after a 50-foot dive, Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked excitedly. Woods captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a seeker, too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy. We'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor. A Nimbus 2000 or a clean sweep seven, I'd say. I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. Flattened in that last match by Slytherin, I couldn't look Severus Snape in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear you're training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he'd left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said. But first year's never. He must be the youngest house player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. 
Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the team, too. Beaters. I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we got to go. Lee, jo Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passageway out of the school. But it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Smarmy that we found in our first week. See ya. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up. Malfoy, flanked by Crab and Goyle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you getting the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now that you're back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing at all little about Crab and Goyle, but as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I'd take you on any time on my own, said Malfoy, tonight if you want. Wizard's duel? Wands only, no contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard's duel before, I suppose. Of course he has, says Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight, all right? We'll meet you in the trophy room. That's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel, said Harry, and what do you mean you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most you and Malfoy will be able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away and punch him on the nose, Ron suggested. Excuse me? They both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. Can't a per eat, person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the points you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught. And you're bound to be. It's really very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end to the day. Harry thought, as he lay awake much later, listening to Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice, such as, if he tries to curse you, you better dodge it, because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch or Mrs. Morris, and Harry felt that he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past 11, Ron muttered at last. We'd better go. They pulled on their bathrobes, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched black shadows. They had almost reached the portrait hole when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger wearing a pink bathrobe and a frown. You, said Ron furiously, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the House Cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, and that's where we're going to stop today. And so very quickly, going to do a couple of quick trivia questions. Um... Not taking any answers till Friday, so if you skip ahead and you're watching this video right now, um, please rewatch it on Friday. Okay. All right. So my first question is, what is the name of the crooked nosed professor who made Harry's scar hurt? Again, what is the name of the crooked nosed professor who made Harry's scar hurt? Okay. And the second question for today. What was Harry chasing Malfoy on the broom for? 
well, or we could say why. Why was Harry chasing Malfoy on the broom during their flying lesson? And then my final question, what position will Harry play on the Quidditch team? What position will Harry play on the Quidditch team? Okay, good luck.